There's a memorable adage for times like these, that people should never fear their government. On the contrary, that the government should always fear the people. Damn straight they should. Those words are correct, because at their heart lies truth, truth never to be forgotten, that the only legitimate power is the power of we the people. Yesterday, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak made a speech outside number 10. Unelected Prime Minister Sunak leads a government from within an establishment that has for years made possible and then turned a blind eye to the very anger and pain that is now only now a problem he wants to bleat about. At the heart of it was a vote, a by-election, that didn't go the way of that establishment. In simple terms, if a Conservative candidate had been returned in Rochdale, it would have been business as usual. Frankly, it would also have been business as usual even if a Labour candidate had been handed a majority, or a Liberal, any establishment puppet. If any of those options had come to pass, courtesy of that same electorate, no one would have blinked. But something else happened instead, something not in the playbook. Veteran campaigner and thorn in the side of the establishment, George Galloway, was elected, and now the electorate responsible is labelled Islamist extremist, and he and they are firmly in the sights of that establishment and its big media. When is an extremist not an extremist? When he votes Conservative or Labour, that's when. Evidently, the government, and by extension Parliament itself, and the whole of the establishment, is finally feeling the heat emanating from all sorts of angry people, grown too numerous to ignore. Finally, the expression of that anger doesn't suit the agenda, and now the people are only bad people. I say too late and too bad for this government, this parliament, this establishment, too little and too late. The story of the popular anger has been years in the making, decades, a tragic story blithely ignored by one manifestation of a rotten establishment after another. That anger has roots in many places and is explained by many factors, but I see it all as symptoms of the same disease. In shorthand, this anger, this genie that won't go back in the bottle, is what a succession of governments get when they set and train and then facilitate the destruction of people's lives and sit back and do nothing to help, or indeed sit back to revel in their power over those people. Most recently, we've endured four years of the most dangerous and blatant assault on freedom and civil rights in the history of humankind. During what should go down in the history books as the era of the scamdemic, those occupying positions of power in government, in medicine, in big tech, in big media, inflicted on the people nothing less than sustained abuse on an unprecedented scale. Abuse that all these years later is still unaddressed and unconfessed, utterly devoid of consequences for the guilty. Excess deaths, two little wor words hung like an albatross around their shoulders. Just days ago, the desperate had the temerity to change the way those deaths are assigned, the totals reached. Instead of facing up to the thousands of people that have died when they shouldn't have died, that are still dying unexpectedly and in ways unexplained every week since sometime in 2021, instead of so much as talking about those deaths, the rules of the game were changed instead to make those dead almost disappear. Almost. Those two little words, excess deaths, are nothing less than a straw to break a camel's back and part of the pressure pushing tectonic plates, moving the ground beneath politicians' feet, and they know it. And now, now, the anger of the people who endured all of that abuse is finally hot enough for the perpetrators to feel, loud enough for them to hear, unpredictable enough for them to fear. And true to form, true to the playbook, they must deflect and distract. Right wing and Islamist extremism, oh yes, that'll do nicely. During the years of the Covid debacle, those politicians, doctors, scientists, big technocrats, big media, were only confident and blasé. And so confident and blasé have they been until very recently, they've not even sought to deny the many ways in which they colluded on a global scale with measures and policies that destroyed millions of lives and that will destroy millions more. By the hand of those perpetrators, trust in the state was destroyed, destroyed for millions for whom it will never return. Likewise, trust in science, trust in those physicians and other medical professionals who through their oaths first do no harm onto the floor and trampled them while they made TikTok videos of their group dance routines. And now the people, too many people, for too many reasons and in too many places are too angry to be ignored any longer. We have witnessed, indeed we continue to witness, the biggest transfer of wealth in history. We've suffered assault on privacy, assault on bodily autonomy, on freedom of speech, freedom to travel, to work. We suffered the insufferable authoritarians who reveled in their power and grew fat on the take. 
And whether those authoritarians knew it or not, the anger rose like flood water. More of their evil nonsense in pursuit of the suicide of net zero finally provoked farmers to rise in protest, protest that spread all across Europe with the full-throated support of growing numbers of citizens. The anger's everywhere you look, here, across Europe, the USA, even in Canada, once the most liberal of places, there is righteous, righteous fury in the aftermath of the crushing of the truckers' protest, protest that saw another entitled designer-suited puppet, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, invoke the Emergency Act so that he might freeze protesters' bank accounts, throw them in jail. The USA has no functioning southern border so that millions of unidentified migrants arrive day and night changing, perhaps forever, the demographic and therefore the traditional voting patterns of state after state. There's talk of secession, even of another civil war. The UK has no border either, none that stops new arrivals by the tens of thousands every year. And people are angry and about more and more every day. I listened to Rishi Sunak's speech, unelected Rishi Sunak, and its background music of someone nearby howling some or other anger. His words, if they were his words, are not the product of chat GPT. Chat GPT, give me a 10 minute speech that makes me sound patriotic and like I'm the champion of democracy and the common people. Honestly, he said Britain is home to a democratic society with a proud past, a reasonable country and a decent people. He said we are a country of great achievements and enduring values and building Britain together. Talk about a brass neck. Where was this sort of rhetoric from Sunak or any other sock puppet when for decades spokesmen and women for communities up and down the country reported lives torn apart and for their troubles were labelled by the establishment as racists and fascists? Where was the talk of a proud past when statues were torn down, as schools and universities brainwashed generations with the certainty that here was a racist, colonialist, imperialist country? Where was the talk of building Britain together then? He said there were forces here at home, quote, trying to tear us apart. I don't know about you, but when I look back at the years just past, I see a government and the country's institutions aided and abetted at all times by a supine mainstream media seeking to do just that, to demonise all who challenged their diktats, like lockdowns, who questioned the safety of gene therapies pushed as vaccines, who challenged sabre-rattling for endless wars. Where was the government's support for peaceful protest when the mainstream media could think of nothing better than to call for so-called anti-vaxxers to be stripped of freedom, maybe have their kids taken from them, maybe be injected against their will? Millions of people here and all over the world, people simultaneously appalled by the events of October the 7th in Israel and by the deaths of tens of thousands of civilians in Gaza since, have marched in protest, calling for an end to it, for a ceasefire, but they are to be characterised to a man and to a woman as Islamist extremists, hate marchers. You can guarantee that the establishment's new robust framework to deal with protests will mean yet more shortening of the leash around our necks in this election year. Sunak talked about the necessity to abide by the rule of law. I look back at the past four years and wonder a great deal about rules. When law-abiding people were shut in their homes, lost their jobs if they wouldn't take doses of gene therapy, not to mention the madness of rule of six, magic arrows on shop floors, masks when standing but not when sitting. I think of all the elderly who died in care homes, cut off from loved ones. I think about those who died in locked wards, ushered to the exit door of life by cocktails of midazolam and morphine, when a different course of action an action predicated upon first doing no harm might have had altogether different outcomes for thousands. Sunak said nearly everyone in Britain supports the basic values of rule of law. Rule of law, playing by the rules, playing the game. I think about behaviour like that and wonder if it's just the rule of law for us and whether it's just blindingly obvious that rules only apply to us and not to those with the power to change the rules at will. Maybe Sunak's right and most people in Britain do support those values of obeying the rules. But if you're asking me, the small and vocal hostile groups who do not, as he described them, is a neat description of the inhabitants of Westminster itself. He said extremists and the far right were equally desperate. Two sides of the same coin, which was rich coming from one of the two cheeks of the same backside, presently sliding up and down the green benches of the Commons in the guise of the Conservative and Labour parties. Referring to Rochdale, he said, Neither group accepts that change in our country can only come through peaceful democratic process. Does that mean a by-election that didn't work out for him 
unelected as he is, already to be characterised as undemocratic. He said those extremists and right-wingers want to set Britain against Britain. He said extremists and their ilk aim to drain us of our confidence in ourselves and as a people. They want us to doubt ourselves, to doubt our country's history. Really, Rishi? I'd got the impression that was your job. Here's the thing. Politicians are properly rattled now after years of cynically frightening the people. What Sunak was up to yesterday was textbook gaslighting. Don't fear us hard-working MPs. Fear those neighbours of yours instead. He invoked, too, the wrong side of history, which is a reckless, some might say desperate move by a puppet up to his strings in the wrong side of history. I agreed on one line he had that our Britain must not be a country in which we descend into polarised camps, but he and his ilk have long since surrendered the right to say as much. The same people who cheerfully and ruthlessly exploited propaganda to drive a divisive rhetoric when it got them what they wanted, now want everyone to pull together as one, as a shield to protect them from the consequences of their actions. As the adage would have it, Parliament is afraid of the people once more, all of the people. This is a good thing.